So here was my problem, and I didn't realize it at the time. I love kids. I just found pediatric medicine boring. Straight up honest. You're going to get some hate. No, in no, the, no, no, no. In the, I uh, found comment. it boring. I'm okay. not saying it is boring. For me, I realized that pediatrics is the internal medicine for kids. And I didn't like internal medicine because I felt like you round, order stuff, eat lunch, you check the stuff that you ordered, you round again, you do sign out, and then you go home. All right. What's good, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Docs Outside the Box. I am your host, Dr. Nee. I am joined by... A sick Dr. Renee. Yo, I had to drag you. I feel like I'm like I walked into the Walking Dead. So for y'all, y'all don't know, I was gone for ten days. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. So I was gone for ten days you on a locum assignment. Again. And um I'm good. You know, I'm sleeping good. I'm going to bed by like eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. I'm just sipping tea, doing my exercises on me and Shanti. Meanwhile, back home in Jersey, y'all are sick. Damn. Yeah, we got hit by the yuck. So everybody in the house got the flu. Yep. Both boys, you got the flu. So not only do you have the flu, the kids got to stay home also. Mm -hmm. So that that sucks. But anyway, um, everybody's doing good. And I had to drag you down to do this episode. But this is a really important episode. And you didn't do your... You can do your Dr. Renee thing. You ain't got the energy for that? Nah, man. This is what you're getting. Okay? <laughs> this is what you're getting. You're getting the zombie apocalypse, Dr. Renee, today. So then that means we're going to jump right into this. So <laughs> listen, guys. You know, one of the things that we want to share more is just kind of our, um, what's the word I want to use? Like our ascension into medicine. Journey. journey into medicine. Whichever way you want to look at it. How we got ascension. to where we are at. <laughs> I'm a trauma surgeon. Renee is an OB guy and doc. And on this episode, we're going to talk about why Renee chose OB. Okay? We're, going get, we're going to keep this topic tight. We're going to go short, sweet, and straight to the point. We know you like to talk, so I'm going to keep make, <laughs> make sure that to keep you on track because you know you like to just kind of just flounder all over the place. So. I don't flounder all over. What mm -hmm. you don't understand is that we there already is floundering a flow. Right now, guys. There's a flow to things, and you know, storytelling is really important. Okay. And you, sometimes you can't just get to the point. You got to tell the story and bring people along your journey. So why did Renee choose OB Gun? Hey, first of all, start off. Tell us. Tell them how many years you've been out. Tell them a little about you about like how you are as OB Gun right now. How I am? Yeah. Like, what do you do? <laughs> so I've been practicing on my own um, since 2010 when I graduated from residency and Right now, right now anyway, I work as an OB hospitalist, ob gyne hospitalist. Um, depending on the facility in which I work, uh, I do mostly OB. Sometimes I can do emergency gyne, but that's pretty much, you know, my, my main scope is doing OB obstetrics. So deliveries. Um, antenatal, which is basically people who are not ready to deliver, but they need to be admitted to the hospital because they're sick, um, things like that. So that's mostly what I do. And However, do you, do you do clinic at all? So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. However, I have done full scope OBGYN, which basically means clinic, um, planned cases in the OR, as well as being on call, as well as going into the ED and all this kind of stuff. I've done that. Um, I think for a total of, I want to say maybe a total of like five years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. But right now I've transitioned from doing full scope to doing OB hospitalist. And how often do you work now per month? Right now I'm working one weekend per month. I'd like to bump that up to two weekends okay. per month, but somebody keeps working 10 days, 15 days out of the month, which makes it hard for me to work two weekends out of the month. Got it. Got you know, it. Got no it. shade. No right. shade. So let's, let's, because we're trying to keep this fast. So listen. Oh, so you just going to ignore the fact that I said that. Yeah, we're moving on from that. So listen, <laughs> let's roll it back into medical school because that's not the person that I thought I met when I first met you, like, Back in 2002. Yeah. Right? Back in 2002, you wanted to be a pediatric endocrinologist. Yeah. So that was, that was my calling. I want to know about <laughs> why you decided you want to be a pediatric endocrinologist and then how you ended up now. So let's let's do that. Let's talk about that. So I always thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. Okay. That's what I thought about. 
since I remember saying I was I wanted to be a pediatrician when I was 10, wow. even though I wanted to be a doctor even before that. Um, I liked kids. I just really enjoyed the company of children. And I just really liked kids. Endocrinology I liked because I was very interested like in the feedback and the pathways. That just was something that always fascinated me. And so, you know, especially when I took biochem, I started realizing like all of that was interrelated and it just had something to do with how the body worked. That's, you know, that yeah. was what my my basic understanding was. I, I just remember being impressed that you wanted to be a pediatric endocrinologist because... And, I don't impress you now? Well, <laughs> you do impress me, but it's the, it's the like, knowing that you wanted to be... Like, I, I, I just remember going through college classes and taking... Bi biochemistry is not where I understood endocrinology. Just leave it to you like that. Biochemistry okay. in medical, in college, is not where I understood endocrinology. <laughs> I did not put two and two together yeah. that what I am studying is, like, the basis of diabetes, the basis of, you know, just lactic acid. Like, I did... It was, I got to memorize this. This is what you got to take to get into medical school and go from there. So I remember when I first met you, you were like, pediatric endocrinology. And you had no experience with... And to, like nothing no. happened to you like mm -mm. oh when I was two years old you know I had this nope. and since then I've always wanted to be a doctor nope. as a matter of fact I wanted to be a pediatric you know those people you know those yeah, people, yeah. Right? like you yeah, have if that something type of happens story. to you you want to be that thing right, right right yeah no that didn't happen to me and actually it's the second time that I took biochemistry because the first time was a bust um, the second time that I took biochemistry was look actually at look at that this is what happened so, what? This, so you took it two times in college yeah, I took it I took it ah. once. I took it once in college and then I took it another time in my post back. Okay. And so when I took it the second time, that's when I understood why I was taking biochemistry. It's honestly biochemistry is the thing that brought medicine all together for me. Like that's what made me understand like, oh, that's why I need to like study science in college. Okay, so you like all the kids. other stuff I didn't really. Yeah. You like kids and you like the kind of feedback loop yeah. type of system type Mm -hmm. physiology type things that Enzyme, I didn't Enzymes, substrates, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff. You understood all that stuff mm -hmm. and you really wanted to go into that. So tell us about what it was like when you were in medical school. Like, um, yeah. you know, we're talking about the first two years. Like, what clubs were you in? I'm assuming you were in the OB club. Or no, not the OB club. You were no. in the PEDS club. No, I wasn't actually in the PEDS club. <laughs> I wasn't in anybody's club. I was in the OB club. Yeah, you were in the OB club. But we can say that for club. another episode. But yeah. No. <laughs> no, I actually was not in the PEDS, in the PEDS club. Um, I don't think I was in any like clinical clubs. I was mostly an SNMA. You was in SNMA. I was just in SNMA. Yo, I was ride or die SNMA, yo. SNMA for life, yo. Student National Medical Association. <laughs> yeah, I was that. And then I was um, our class president, yes. our medical school class president um, that first year. I think I year. stuffed the ballots for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He was about to lose. No, I wasn't. And I was like, let me stuff the ballot for this girl. Really? Middle of the night, I went in there and put all the fake stuff in there. Yeah, like, you yeah. put all the fake stuff? Oh, yeah. And oh, so yeah. they had like 400 votes. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, there's only 200 people in our class. Yes, absolutely. Okay, you know what? You lying. <laughs> um, <and laughs> all right, so we got to establish that you weren't in any clubs. No, I wasn't in any clinical clubs. Let's just say specialty specific. Right, specialty specific. You was in Student yeah. National Medical Association. Right or okay. die. All right, so let we're getting so you're finishing your first two years, mm -hmm. right? And mind you, I also want to make it clear I did I never shadowed a pediatrician. <laughs> I never shadowed a pediatrician. As a matter of fact, I shadowed an internist. Well, actually, a gastroenterologist who also did um, uh, internal med, um, and then I shadowed a surgeon. So. <laughs> I never did. I never shadowed oh my a pediatrician. God. Guys, don't listen to what she's telling you right now. Why? You do not do this. Why? So you shadowed someone and you wanted to be a doctor. But you never shadowed what you wanted to be, though. No, I never shadowed what I wanted to so be. So you would give that advice to other people? Um. So here, here's the thing, right? Shadowing, I tell students, you shadow who you can shadow. You don't go out and look for what you think you want to be. First of all, you might not end up being it i.e. why we're having this discussion right I shadowed, now. I shadowed a trauma surgeon. I became a trauma surgeon. Yeah, but you also joined and the I OB did, club. And I did quite well. Anyway, and you fought me when I said to you, you have a surgeon's personality, but that's for another episode. Anyway, um, got very insulted by that, I remember. But anyway, 
Um, so, yeah, I tell my students, you shadow who you can shadow, especially now when shadowing experiences are really hard. That is true. It's, it's a little bit difficult now. So, yeah, you guys, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. So, don't listen to him. He don't, we are trying don't to give ke- good pre-med hey, advice like let's, me. Let's stay on I'm track. the pre-med strategist. I got you. Say I'm it. the podcast strategist. Okay, right? but say I'm the pre-med strategist. You are strategist. the pre-med, pre-med strategist. Uh, Alfred, hook it up. Put it something on the bottom that says pre-med I'm strategist, I'm the pre-med please. strategist. All right. So your first two years, you still gung-ho, pediatric endocrinologist. Yeah. We go into third year where we are doing rotations. You are going into <laughs> different rotations. We're going in. You're doing OB. You're doing family medicine. You're doing general surgery. You get to peds. No, so, but actually, no. I went to family. I went to um, internal medicine. I went to peds and then I went to OB and that's an, a, that's a very important sequence. So you and I did our peds rotation yeah, tell them what together. You did tell them what you did that. We did it at Children's Mercy yeah, in Kansas, Kansas City. City, Missouri. And, um, I was really gung ho. I, I did not like that rotation. I'm just going to be up front. I was very gung ho about that rotation because I was okay. like, oh, I'm finally going to be doing what I want to do. Hey, go be a pediatrician. Hey. So we get there and, um, you know, <laughs> we're going through the rotation. And every morning they would ask, uh-huh. you know, you sitting in rounds, Goodness, you know, and they pimping the students and stuff. Child, I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with these kids. He got a fever for five days. I'm like, I I don't know. My mother, she would put some real masquiti. <laughs> Alfred, I'm going to have to spell Alfred, that one for that you. Alfred, put that down there. I'm going to have to spell that, that, that one creole. for you. Put that creole in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she put some real masquiti on your chest like I just did for our two boys upstairs with their fever. <laughs> and then I was better. That's it. That's the bulk of what I knew in pediatrics. All right. So there's everything is like the dosage of medications <laughs> is mix per kegs. You were you wasn't you didn't. So really... here was my problem. And I didn't realize it at the time. My problem was I love kids and people always say to me, oh, it must have been the parents. It wasn't the parents. I just found pediatric medicine boring. That was I'm serious. I'm I'm gonna be <laughs> straight up honest. Like you I just some hate. You're gonna get some hate. No, in no, the, no, 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 no. I uh, found comments. it boring. I'm okay. not saying it is boring, but for me, it just was not exhilarating for me. For me, I realized that pediatrics is the internal medicine for kids. And I didn't like internal medicine because I felt like you round, you order stuff, you eat lunch. You check the stuff that you ordered, you round again, you do sign out, and then you go home. And for me, I just found that boring. I didn't like it. You know, the procedure, like, there are very few procedures. I just I just didn't like it. I was bored majority of the day. We watched a whole Indian Bollywood movie yeah. during our rotation. The Disco Dancer, which the is disco dancer. one of the greatest, Alfred, for me, one of the greatest Bollywood movies of all Jimmy, time. Jimmy, Jimmy. Yeah. Acha, acha. So basically, guys, the disco dancer is. See, now we going on a tangent. I didn't want to go on, but the disco dancer <laughs> basically is a parody of Saturday Night Fever. Right? Yes. So amazing movie, but okay, I get it. <laughs> you think it's boring. So did, did, at any point were you like, uh oh? Yeah, this, this you know problem. I was. There's a problem. You know I was because I told you you were the first person I told. I was like, yeah, I don't think I like pediatrics. <laughs> I didn't like it because I, I thought it was what, m- very malignant. I was like, well, why is this so malignant? This pediatrics. Remember? I was like, why are y'all stressing me about this for? Like, Anyway, let's move on. So they were talking about I you. don't even understand what that oh, means. You know what that means. No, I don't. We'll talk about it when you ask me oh, why okay. I chose trauma surgery. But well, go ahead. Okay. No, well, what was your question? So basically, you <laughs> knew something was up. At the yeah, end of the I did. I knew something was up. You were the first person that I told. I was like, yeah, I don't think I like pediatrics. And the problem was that I had pretty much gone through most of my rotations at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And I knew that OB, actually OB was the last rotation of that third year. Were you even looking forward to it at all? No, No, because I told you, I was like, all I got is OB left. I damn sure don't want to do that. Right. So when you did OB, (laughs) tell us about OB. So I did OB. 
And what kind of because uh, when we obviously that was the pediatric rotation was basically a residency program. Yeah, it was a residency very program. Very hierarchical, yeah. traditional type of yeah, rotation. Very much. So when you did your OB resident or your OB rotation, what was that like? So the OB rotation that I did actually was with a private doctor. Okay. Um. So he had like I think two or three partners. Um. But I was mostly with this particular doctor. Um. He worked out of one hospital. Um. His office he you had to travel back and forth to go to the hospital in the office and things like that anyway um so i go in and like the first day that i'm there we go into the hospital and we do what is my first delivery and i'll never forget the delivery because the father almost passed out he was like oh my god just like you were thinking tv <laughs> but it, it, it actually, it actually happen. happens it actually <laughs> happens the father okay. passed out um but i thought it was just Amazing, because here's what I didn't realize about OB. When they were teaching us OB in second year, you know, when you look at the fetal monitor, the fetal strips. No, I don't you remember. remember well, anyway, okay. they showed the fetal <laughs> strips. I, I, like, I understood it, but I didn't have a, a real concept of it because I had never seen a woman in labor before. So... It was I like, mean, but I think a lot of people feel that way. Like it's just the fetal heart tones versus yeah, like a yeah. real delivery. Like exactly, if they just show you the strip. Like right, you you to... don't you just don't get it. Right. And so for me, that was like I don't know. Like I thought that was really really interesting. And the nurses at that particular hospital were, were actually very helpful, mm -hmm. and they were showing me you know the fetal strips and you know the decelerations, accelerations, and I was like, oh, this is you know this is pretty cool. Um, and so we did the first delivery and I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's so amazing. You know, she had a baby. Everybody's so happy. It's like, she's young, she's healthy, nobody dying and crashing. And I just thought it was really amazing. Then we went in, we did a C-section. I was like, man, this is a lot of blood, but look, she's fine. Nobody dying. Nobody's <laughs> crashing. Everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. We leave, we go to the office and we see... GYN patients, non-pregnant patients, and um, as well as some pregnant patients, but we see a bunch of non-pregnant patients. And just to give people a timing, like this is the end of third year. Yeah, when this you should have actually. This is your last rotation. This is your last third year rotation. <laughs> You've already started like signing up for sub eyes, right? Because this is part of the story. Like you have a pediatric hospitalist. What is it? PD ED. Uh, what? Don't you have a? Didn't you have a pediatric emergency? Yeah, but room? I hadn't even signed up for that yet. And what's worse? Wait, before even that. Before even that, my third year elective was a pediatric endocrinology elective. You remember okay. that? Let's get back to that story. So the OB story. So you're doing guy now. You yeah, even loving I'm doing guy. I'm I'm you know I'm like oh my gosh I'm seeing all of the you know feedback and lose the progesterone, the mm -hmm. you know, ovaries, the everything. And long I'm story like, short, you like it. I like it. Okay, so I you, like it. So right. I come back. I come back home one day and I say to you, you probably don't even remember this, but I'm like. I think I like OB. Mm. And you're like, what? Because it was Is that how I said it? Laughing. Yeah, you were like, what? Who has said that? Who, yeah, who has said that? Okay. And um, That's not what I said, guys. Yeah, that's what you had said. That's not how I say those things. And that's what you had said. Nah. Um, but I, anyway. I probably said it's third year. You, you finishing up third year. You got to know <laughs> what the hell you're going to do. You signing up for sub eyes. I was like, I think I like OB. And you were like, well, who has said that? Ain't no chicken hawk. And then <laughs> you see how she's going on a tangent, guys. Anyway, so um, so yeah, so then I realized that I like OB, but I'm not sold yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not sold because this is my first ever like exposure to OB, and I just don't want to be so fascinated by this thing that I make my, a whole life decision based on something that I'm like, oh, that was pretty cool, and then end up hating it later on. Okay, so the next rotation was pediatric endocrinology. No, actually, pediatric endocrinology was before this. Okay, did you like it or not? I can't remember. I did, actually. Okay. I did really enjoy that rotation, but I then realized that in order to go into pediatric endocrinology, I'd have to go through pediatrics first and I was like I don't want to do that gotcha I was gotcha. like I don't want to do that but I still had not convinced myself at that time because remember after my OB rotation I still was like I don't know if I want to do OB or if I want to do peds now I remember you did a pediatric emergency room yes, rotation that's when I wasn't, went that, out wasn't like Akron. the final wasn't that the final nail in the coffin 
So, yes, I ended up doing a pediatric um, ED rotation. So I did a couple of sub eyes. I did MFM Mm -hmm. and then I did pediatric ED. And I said, by the time I finished, I think MFM was the first one that I did. And then when I went to Akron Children's, I said, after Akron's, I'm making the decision. That's it. And this is now your fourth year now. This right? is my. I'm in my fourth year. We are getting into are my fourth year. Getting ready to start putting in stuff for ERAS. Oh, people were putting stuff in for ERAS already. Yeah. I was late. So what's what's this? I was this is like late. this is like all no. This is like September now, right? Yeah, this is September. This might be even be October. Meanwhile, everyone, ERAS opened like <laughs> July first, right? So people are already submitting their applications. Programs are already giving people like interviews for residency. And well, I this... wasn't ready yet. All right, go ahead. Keep going. I wasn't ready. Keep going. Come on, let's go. And so, um, and I didn't want to be one of those people. And I, and no, no, nothing against that, but I didn't want to be where I was applying to two different types of programs. Right. That was. I wanted option. to make the decision because, again, I I actually didn't know what I wanted to do, and I knew that peds was rubbing me the wrong way but i wanted to be sure that i didn't want it and so i did my mfm first that's when we moved to chicago and i really liked it Mm -hmm. you know some procedures you know got it we got you like an ob i'm really like an ob let's talk about that pediatric hospitalist rotation so i did the pediatric hospitalist or ed rotation rotation, yes and (laughs) i i don't know guys i just even at the pace of the ed I still was not, it, I just wasn't feeling it. I think I remember you, and you think I don't listen to you. I think what you said, you listen to me. what you didn't like was about at least the ED part was the lack of, you weren't really able to know what the patient really wanted. Like, yes. it was almost like you, you didn't say it, but it was almost like, were you talking about like, it's like veterinary medicine and stuff? Yeah. And, I mean, I think that was really. For me, it was the inability to speak because you were seeing really young kids. Yeah, Yeah. it's the inability to speak to the patients. Yeah, right, and especially in their time of need, right when they're really, really vulnerable in their time of need. And I just felt like I, I just didn't have the capacity to be able to do that. The, the ED rotation, I think that's what really highlighted it for me. So not only did I find the medicine of pediatrics not really appealing or exciting but that extra thing where I just was not able to communicate with many of my patients obviously the older they got the more I was able to communicate with them but the really really little ones the infants the babies I just felt like yeah if I do this it's it's gonna take a lot and I might be a hazard before I'm a help (laughs) (laughs) So that was the nail in the coffin, and you're like, all right. Yeah, and I was like, it. if I look at one more set of ears, I think I'm gonna go crazy. And so now, um, so now we're like October now, right? <laughs> yeah, we're right. Yeah, and, we're and now, about in like, you're behind. The, now you're behind. Yeah, I'm behind. It's official. You're behind. Yeah, it's so official. You submit your ERAS, your schools, and or your the programs. The and programs. These are all OB programs. Yes, they're only OB programs. So how, how hard were was it difficult for you to come to conclusion that hey, I'm just gonna go to OB route because you had told everybody at this point pediatrics. Oh, pediatric from the time I was ten years old. Right. So at this point now, yeah. where it's time to start putting in the applications for OB, did you have an issue with that? <laughs> so, a come to Jesus moment. So. I had to I had to reconcile in my own mind, first of all, before anybody else. It was important for me to think about, you know, what I had said and what I was experiencing in that moment. And for me, I was like, this is what it's going to be like. I'm I now want to go into women's health. I just find that this is this is where I feel like I can thrive. So I remember telling, you know, my parents like, yeah, I'm not going to go into pediatrics anymore. I'm going to go into OBGYN. And my mother was like, oh, my God, I wanted to be an OBGYN, which I had never known. (laughs) (laughs) I did not know that. Um, uh, Yeah, my mom, I think, and my dad actually wanted to go into OB. I think. I think my dad wanted to go into OB, too. But anyway, um, so I was like, oh, okay, you know. Pivot easy. But I do remember when I was getting into when I was getting ready to go into residency, I told my friend Nikisha, um, who has known me since I was five years old. And I told her, yeah, I'm going to be doing OBGYN. She goes, what happened to pediatrics? Mm, So that that was the first 
person who's like, wait, yeah, what happened? How you were as pre when you were ten, when right. we were in fifth grade, you matter. said right. Um, and so she was like, okay, you know, I mean, it wasn't that big a deal for her. She wasn't so disappointed, but I realized. You know, Lucy, you got some splitting to well, do. Well, there's an identity that you had before and exactly. that people associated. And now that you're making a, a, you're changing, it's almost like you have a different identity. And right. some, some people may be like, whoa. Yeah. So I remember that. I, but I also remember you didn't have a, a difficult time kind of switching over. How, yeah. how many programs did you end up applying to? I think I applied to like 40 programs. Oof. We should do um, the mathematics on how much that costs. Oh, God. Well, I don't know how much it was back then. But so which which residency did you end up going to? Tell us. I ended up going to Robert Wood Johnson the Medical UMD School. UMD and J J. UMD and J now known yeah. as Rutgers. Um, so that's where I ended up doing my residency program. Um, stayed there for four years and graduated in 2010. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the reason I, I want that story to be told is like, yo, like. If anybody knows, like the that process of applying and putting in your applications to all of these different residencies, that stuff starts July first, right? And the fact <laughs> it's that supposed you, to. and the fact that you are it still can. trying to make a decision, and it's now October, and you still got in, is you yeah. know I want people to understand that sometimes you just have to change your mind and kind of go in a different direction. And yeah. no matter what everybody else says or what you know, this identity that you had that people are attaching themselves to, you don't necessarily have to be attached to that. You can change your mind. Yeah, took so, a risk. So, you know, one thing that I, I thought I was going to comment on or what? I was going to ask you on is when you said your dad wanted to be an OB. Yeah. You got some thoughts on men being OB. What's your thoughts on that? Hot take, hot take, hot take, hot take, hot take. So I had this discussion. Should men be OB? So I had this. I'm not going to comment on should they. Should men be OB? The fact that they can doesn't matter. With, like um, That's not like, the point of podcast. It doesn't matter That's whether the they should. We don't want nuance. The fact that they should can. Men be is OB? Neither, it, should is neither here nor there. <laughs> but... I will tell you that I think that there is a huge limitation for men because they've never experienced what it's like to be a woman, right? So if I come to you and I say I'm experiencing cramps, you don't quite know what that feels like. Okay. Right? You don't you don't know what that feels like. Like that's you know, you don't have the inconvenience of having a period. You don't have the inconvenience of potentially having a heavy period. Like you don't have, you've never experienced, you know, potentially the, um, you know, the embarrassment of a little girl, right? Understood. Who's had a period and has had an accident with it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so there are those things that men don't necessarily understand so that when you say like, oh, but my periods are heavy or my, you know, my periods are this, my periods are that, that sometimes that might get dismissed, you mm, know, that might okay. not be like at the top of, you know, that might not be at the top of the list of things to fix. It's like, well, what's the problem? Just, you know, wear a tampon. Well, what about done. women who do urology? Particularly male men urology, male urology. Yeah, well, what what problem do y'all have I mean, as we, little boys? We got issues. That, you know like what? what? We got like issues what? and stuff that like you what? know. Like I'm not speaking from experience, but you like know, what? we got issues and stuff. Like and, what? And y'all don't got the same type like of anatomy. What, what does a little boy like, experience? No, tell me because I've never been a little you boy. You know, puberty and things that happen in puberty and okay. stuff. You know, like, and, like what? What you know, is happening like, with your urethra? And your ureters. <laughs> that. Well, what what don't you like? I mean, guys go through things that women don't go through. So, do you think? Tell me what is happening with your urethra and your ureters that nobody else can understand. If you explain that to me, then I'll be more than happy to accept that explanation. Hey, but Alfred, you got nothing. Alfred, Christian, give us like a fifteen minute or fifteen second uh, break. Let's take a break real quick. And we're back, guys. <laughs> you do not want to know All what right, so you what, just said. So what's your hot take? So men can be obese? What do you think? They yes, do? men technically can be obese. But what I'm saying is that I feel like there is a limitation. There's a limitation. I'm sorry. But, you know, you just don't experience certain things. You've never experienced breast pain. Right. Like, but you've seen amazing OB doctors. Who, of and, course I have. One of my mentors is is an OB doc. He is an OB guy and unk. So. Shout out to Dr. Who's it? Who are you talking about? Dr. Aiken. Oh, that's, I wanted to make sure we talk about the same person. All right, cool. What other guy and unk do you know that's my mentor? Hot take real quick. But that was a weak hot take, though. That was kind of like a. 
medium take. But anyway, if you're going to take it, just go right into it. That's a warm take? Yeah, it was a warm take. Yeah, Let's talk about your, your work-life balance. You what is to talk about what's your, what, what's your hot take. Hey, what is your work-life <laughs> balance? Tell us about what it's like for you to work. Right. So, well, I'll talk about my work-life balance before I was doing what I was doing, before I was doing what I am doing. Um, so before when I was doing Full Scope OBGYN, um, I don't think that there was anything that was a work-life balance. You know, I would go into the clinic or office and I would work all day. So how often was clinic? Let's say in a, in a week. So how when often, I first started doing Full Scope OBGYN, I was actually working five days. That's gotcha. when I was out in Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, so I was doing Full Scope there, working about five days a week being on call, um, doing, you know, elective surgeries, things like that. Um, so, you know, it. I don't know that there was what I would call a full, like, work-life balance. I was bringing work home with me because I had to check, you know, labs, check images, call patients back. So did you have partners or you did not technically have partners? I did have partners, but... My partners and I didn't share patients. Okay, so this was, for the most part, when you came out of residency, Yeah, you were in Idaho. This was a very traditional ob guy type yeah. practice. And it was actually I w it was actually a locum's assignment, mm -hmm. but it was a full-scope OB-GYN locum's assignment where I was building a practice for another doctor who was going to be coming in. So how long were you there for? I was there for 10 months. Ten months, they put you in a hotel. Oh, sorry, they put you in a, in a house. In a house. It was like a townhouse. Yeah. They gave you a car, mm -hmm. and you were there for ten months, yeah. and you were there basically like a transition, almost like a bridge. Yeah. Until to someone, another practice. They had signed a really, yeah. They had signed a doctor who was still in residency or mm -hmm. fellowship, and when they finished. Yep, she okay. was to come and take over the practice. Okay. So I was building her practice. So I did that. Um, later on, when we moved to Pennsylvania. I was actually doing full scope OBGYN, but at that point I was doing part time, which you couldn't believe because yeah, I, I wanted you to get that full time money. You That's wanted me to get that full time money, but you also wanted that full time wife. I didn't say I wanted a full time wife. I just oh, so you wanted a part time wife. I knew we had a part -time lot of debt. Time lovers. We had a lot of debt. We was trying to bring our money together, and I was like, "Ain't nothing wrong with your faculties. Go work." So that's how I was. And Go then work. what had happened? I mean, halfway through like the year, I was like yeah. halfway. It was a month into it. What I was like, I was about? like, I barely see you. What's going on and stuff like that. But and you were like, I thought you were working part time, and I said, Honey, this is part time. Yeah. 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 Your part time is very similar to like a cardiologist full time. Full time. Or yeah. Like I was bringing a lot of home, like a home. lot of work home. Because I'm shift work, guys. I yeah. like when I finish. You're you know, done. I'm done. Someone takes over, tag their it. The most I may have is a couple of charts here and there. Yeah. Um, but you are responsible for clinic lab results and yep. calling people back and all those different yep. things. Elective surgeries, ED, being on call, doing consults on the floor. I mean, it was just, it was a lot. And then at that time, you know, we were trying to start our family. So that also became an issue, um, you know, trying to do IVF on top of that. So all of those things, you know, made me realize that, hmm, is full scope OB what I want to do with the rest of my career? And so I decided no. And so then I had to pull actually from, I had to actually pull from the archives, which basically means that, so you know that after I finished residency, I started doing locums right, right. out of residency. And one of the first locums, well, one of the first locums assignments that I did actually was through Comp Health. Yes. And Comp Health. Good old Comp Health. Good old Comp Health. One of the largest locum company out there. Yeah. 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 Prob Is it the largest? I Between think them and Weatherby. Yeah. And I think they're like, anyway. But so Comp Health um, had an assignment out in Tifton. Georgia. That's when I was living in Atlanta. And Tifton was, I think Tifton was about like a good three, four hours away from where I was living in Georgia. But anyway, so they had an assignment where I would go into the rotation for this couple. This couple was an OBGYN couple. So speaking about should men be OBs? Anyway, the problem was that it was their own private practice. They didn't have any other partners. 
So that means somebody had to be on call every weekend. So they never got a chance to spend time with their family. They had, I think they had two kids or something like that. So in their, because I was in their rotation, that was the weekend that they were able to go to the lake, you know, go to the baseball Mm -hmm. game, do, you know, go on a little vacation or something like that. And that's when I started realizing, hmm, if I do locums, then I'm actually helping out this family. Like not just the OB, not just, oh, you know, I'm seeing these patients. Not just I'm making good money, but I'm actually helping out an entire family. And so for me, that experience with, you know, with Comp Health, like really helped me to realize the kind of the... The role that you wanted to play. Yeah, the role that I wanted to play in my career beyond just seeing patients. So I think that that is key because I think a lot of times people see... Well, we talked about you changing from pediatric endocrinology Mm -hmm. to OB, right? That's an identity change. Right. For the most part, right? Yeah. That's kind of like an identity change. That's a big identity change, I would say. Granted. But there's also the exposure of seeing how you want to practice and realizing that maybe the way in which you wanted to traditionally practice Mm -hmm. is not the way that you currently want to practice. Yeah. And I liken it to baseball, right? Like there's pitchers in baseball, Mm -hmm. right? But there are starters and then there are middle relievers and then there are people who close the game, Mm -hmm. pitchers who close the game. And not everybody fits in. It's not interchangeable. There are just some people who are like, look, I just want to come in at the eighth, you know, in the eighth inning and I just want to pitch two innings and I'm just going to throw 100 miles per hour the entire way. And I don't want to be the person who has to start the game mm-hmm. and have to measure my, you know, do a pitch count and all of these different things. And I feel like that's kind of like how you were, mm-hmm. where you're like, wait, I see where I fit in this whole OB healthcare kind of system thing. Yeah. And I fit right in this thing where I am allowing these main, you know, these traditional OB docs to kind of have the lifestyle that they want. Yeah. And then I get, I the, get life, the lifestyle, lifestyle that I, I want. want. Yeah. You know, and um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I look at it. So it's pretty dope, actually. Yeah. So, you know, um, if you guys are looking to maybe, you know, do some locums with Comp Health. Yes. um, Like I did. um, CompHealth.com. C-O-M-P-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com. You can go ahead and check them out. They always have some good um, locums assignments for you. So, yeah. yeah, I worked with them when I went out to Idaho. Remember? Ah, yeah, when I was okay, in, yeah, when yeah, I was in yeah. Boise, Idaho, low key Boise, Idaho. Yo, Boise. It's like Atlanta of the West. Yeah, <laughs> y'all, y'all. I wouldn't sleeping. go that far. Y'all, it's not, nah, but it, it's people nice. sleeping. Yo, people are sleeping on Boise, Idaho. It's I hot really, as hell, though, man. I really enjoyed myself out there. Actually, one of one of my schools um, on my medic app is actually out in Boise. I come Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine. Okay. Well, let's 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 round this out now. Yeah. If you were to look back, you were to give advice to the residents out there or anybody else who's listening, what kind of what would you do differently looking at all the stuff? I don't think I'd do anything differently, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I needed I think I needed the path that I took. I needed it um, because it really helped me to grow. It helped me to figure out what I like, what I don't like. It helped me to get out of my comfort zone it helped me to just be more confident with what I wanted to do. Do you think you'd be happy being a pediatrician at this no. point? <laughs> Straight up, think, no. What do you think you would have done if you went, like, do you think you would have just finished and gone right back and done, like, an OB residency? So if I was really very concerned about what people would think about me switching and, like, oh, you know, I, I said I was going to be OB. I mean, I said I was going to be pediatrics. You know, I said I was going to well, do but this that, thing. That's, but that's not your personality. That's no, not it's the not. mindset that you would it's have. Not. So as the person who made the decision to change. Right. Let's say you just decided, you know what? Maybe it's like my immature mind saying, go do OB on a whim. I'm going to stick with pediatrics. Ugh. What would you say then? Like you're like. I'll, you know, so I'm, you know me, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I don't know that I would be fully mm-hmm. happy doing pediatrics. Um, I, I think at some point I would probably just go the whole way and do the fellowship because, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stopped at pediatrics. I would have been like, nope, need to get that endocrinology because I can't, I can't see these kids like this. (laughs) I mean, I was the same way with GI. I really wanted to be, remember I was really interested in GI, but then I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to do three years of internal medicine. Yeah, that ain't for exactly. me. Exactly. And look at you. You can still drive the bus now. That's true. That's true. See? I could cut you open and drive the bus. And drive the bus. Mm. That's what we call colonoscopies, y'all. Drive the bus. 
So listen, <laughs> for the students, for the residents, um, and even from the young attendings, like what do we want y'all to gain from this, right? I think that there's two points of this of this episode. There's, you know, your thoughts on changing pace, mm -hmm. going from pediatrics to going to OB, but then also is the same thing at the end is, what do we want the students, what do we want the residents to gain from this? And I think three things that come to mind for me is, one, you can always change your mind. Heck yeah. Right? Heck yeah. And then, actually, sorry, two things that come to mind. Two is the rule of the sunken cost fallacy. Have you heard of that? No. Yes. Yeah, you've heard of the sunken I cost have, fallacy. I have. Yeah, we've talked about it on the show before. So the sunken cost fallacy is something that has been studied for decades. Basically, it is we'll, con we'll continue down a path or endeavor only because we have invested time, money, emotion, knowing that the investment, the costs that we put in initially are not recoverable, mm -hmm. right? So for you, I told everybody that I wanted to be a pediatric endocrinologist. Yep. I wanted to be a pediatrician. And you know, like after rotation, after rotation, after rotation, I do not like this, but I spent so much time telling everybody about this. This is like people, you know, when they think of Renee being a doctor, they think of her being a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. If I go back and change that, there's this guilt that you may feel and as a result, there's this negative connotation that you put on top of this feeling of wanting to change. When in actuality, don't nobody care but me. Nobody cares. <laughs> and as a result, you don't change. You continue yeah. down that same path. And yeah. now you're mad. Yep. Five years in. Yep. Why didn't I switch to OB? Exactly. People do that with relationships. Yeah. You know? So, so. It, it says here, emotions cause us at times to not think rationally. If we abandon an endeavor that we put investment in. Right. Mm -hmm. Our emotions place a negative story on it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. once again, if we abandon an endeavor that we put investment in, our emotions place a negative story on it, like guilt, mm -hmm. abandonment or even wastefulness. I yeah. wasted all this. I wasted time. all this time. I wasted all this time. Right. Why am I doing it? And this overshadows the rational thought process. Mm -hmm. So to avoid those negative feelings of guilt, abandonment, wastefulness, we continue down that path. Right. Right. Because you're like, well, I already put all this all it is into it so i might as well just finish it right and the, the whole point is is like listen like you're not going to recover these costs anyway right right everything that you put in initially you're not going to get that back yeah so you're not going to get it back and even if you continue down that path you're still not going to get it back because right. you're going to be resentful so here's another here's an easier example let's say for example you know you bought a beyonce ticket to her concert it was fifty dollars right Three weeks later, on the day of the um, of the show, you find out that one, it's raining. Two, you're sick. Right? You felt like you felt yesterday. Oh God! Right? Yesterday was horrible. And you're like, man, like, I already spent fifty dollars on this ticket. Should I go? Even though you know there's gonna be a lot of traffic, you're gonna go out in the rain. You're probably gonna get more sick out mm -hmm. there. Right? So there's already a present cost that should probably cause you to change and make a different decision. But the initial investment is going to be the ultimate driving force, which is the $50. Even though whether you go to the concert or you don't go to the concert, you ain't getting that $50 back. Well, see, if it were a Lauren Hill concert, oh, then I would on, know listen. I don't need to go because she ain't probably going to show up anyway. She'll show, but she'll be late as hell. <laughs> She'll come the last like 20 minutes. Like, what's going on, y'all? I do love Lauren Hill, though. But <laughs> I wouldn't great. pay to see her. She, she's great, but she late as hell. So. <laughs> so everyone, listen. Basically, Renee did not fall victim to the sunken cost fallacy. Nope. Um, this happens a lot in relationships, though, right? And yep. it happens in people making decisions as to what residency they're going to go to, um, what part of the country they're going to live in. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I want to mention, though, real quick, I think medical schools like knowingly participate in this fallacy. <laughs> right. Because they know Why do you say that because they know like the prices or at least the tuition goes up on a yearly basis. And they know that, listen, you took the MCAT score like you're very dedicated. You've made the decision like you're not going to go back on it. Right. So when you go from a first year tuition of $50,000 to the next year, it's 59000 then 60, 70. It's like, what are they going to do, leave? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they put in the initial cost, the initial <laughs> investment. <laughs> and maybe that's a hot take, but I do think, I do, I do think that, uh, that's I, a hot take. I do think institutions of higher learning do participate in this and they kind of know that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I had a discussion today 
um, actually with a pre-med advisor and we were just kind of talking because um, she was interested in what I do with pre-meds. But one of the things that she said was that, you know, she works in Georgia and a lot of her students are interested in going to school in Atlanta. Like, yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's where they want to go to school. And so for them, you know, to talk about schools outside of Georgia, much less outside of Atlanta. They're forget not try- it. They're not trying to like, hear that. They're not trying to hear that. And I'm like, well... <laughs> and there's not many medical schools in, in Atlanta. And right. So, Atlanta's nice. It's Wakanda. But there's plenty more out there. And, yeah. Well, listen, that is um, mm-hmm. basically a wrap, right? That is how Renee yeah. chose OB. Um, sometime in the future, we'll do why knee decided to choose, decided to go to uh, general surgery as well as trauma surgery. Um, but this is something a little bit of what we wanted to kind of let y'all know about yeah. the decisions um, and some of the hard time, hard decisions and last minute decisions that we made. And a lot of times people think that, okay, well, you know, you didn't have any strife when you're making yeah. you know, a big time decision. But we exactly. want folks to know that, like, we're just like everyone else. Like, we've had some tough decisions to make um, as a couple, as well as individually. Mm-hmm. And we're still here. So we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. Leave comments below Did on any YouTube. any of you fall into the sunken cost fallacy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just watching the show. I already made it 15 minutes. I might as well just finish it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, guys, we are out. We will catch you guys on the next episode of Docs Outside the Box, y'all. Peace. Peace. <laughs>